So I'm going to get started with our circulation basics in the web client. The first thing I'm going to do is log in. And so as you all, of course, know, you don't have to download any software to use the web client. And we are recommending that the web client be used for circulation processes only. Uh, we do not recommend using it for cataloging, acquisitions, or any of the administrative functions. Uh, those are still in a state of, well, they're a little buggy. <laughs> and so um, they're working on getting the uh, cataloging bugs resolved. And so our cataloging committee is monitoring that to make sure that we're ready uh, when when those are ready. We're we're going to be able to rec make recommendations uh, for cataloging. But as of now, circulation only. A lot of the admin screens are basically just a copy of what was in the staff client. First of all, I'm going to log in here, and so you can see that I have my login address here. I'm going to log in to our new training data database that. Uh, was upgraded for us to 3.1.5, just like our staff client that we're using in Next. And so this is going to allow me to look freely at, at patrons' accounts without fear of, of exposing any of our actual patrons' data. So this is, I'm excited to be able to, to use this for the first time. So I'm going to log in here with my account, and you're going to see that it, it is going to ask me to set up a workstation. This is something that will happen whenever uh, you're just doing this for the first time, or if your browser cache has been cleared, then your workstation information will also be cleared unless you uh, load something called Hatch. And Hatch is something that we are uh, looking at and we're going to make recommendations about how to use Hatch for the workstation and for printing in some, some future discussions. So we should have a, a future webinar for folks who, who are going to be handling the Hatch uh, work for you all. So I do want to register a workstation at my system. And I'm going to register that. And then I can tell it use now. And I will have to log in again. with my workstation listed. So that's all that's required to register a workstation and to log in. Of course, uh, some of the considerations are that your administration may be reporting on your workstation. So consistency in the naming of the workstations is very important. So it is something that uh, your administration for your library system is going to need to specify for you and give you the specific name that they want uh, to be used for each workstation so that their reporting is consistent. I did want to show you also that uh, this information is all in our circulation in 3.1 knowledge book, and I've been working on getting uh, all of this information published. A lot of it is from the Evergreen documentation, but I've augmented it with some more information, screenshots, and NC Cardinal specific information. So you don't have to necessarily consult the video. You can also consult the knowledge book here. So it has the workstation information, and it also has logging in and out. And we're also going to talk about setting browser defaults for your web client. So uh, it's important for you to use Chrome. Evergreen does allow Firefox, but we found that uh, some of the other libraries that are using 3.1 are recommending Chrome only. And so that's what we're doing also. We're recommending that you use Chrome. If your library system is not currently using Chrome, this is a link to the download. Obviously, you would want to discuss that with your IT folks and make sure that that's set up correctly. Um, we do also do have information in the upgrade knowledge book about uh, certain ports that need to be open. So that's something they'll want to consult as well. And so uh, I did want to just show you uh, that there are ways that you can uh, set up Chrome as your startup page. 
and as your home page. And those are two separate things. One thing that um, was brought to my attention is that sometimes uh, your IT has set your uh, library website as your startup page, and that's fine. Uh, you can also, though, set up your home page. And so you can do that by going to the three dots here and going to settings. And so in Chrome, the startup page and the home page are two separate things. So you can see uh, my little home button here. I can set that up by choosing uh, to turn that on, toggling it to the right, and adding this web address for uh, my trainer in there. Obviously, once we're live, then you'll add your production information. So it'll be your library system short code here and uh, then ncardinal.org and the EG staff. All that information, again, is in the knowledge book here. So I've set that up. Um, the start page is a separate one. So even if they have your startup page, you might be able to make your home page. Obviously, this is something you want to consult your IT folks about uh, before you before you make those changes. Um, and you may not have the permission to make those changes without their help. So, but that is that is something that you can take advantage of. So, I did just want to make you aware of that. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about bookmarks. One of the things that is a little different about the web client is that you don't have uh, hot buttons across the top, but you can make bookmarks on your browser, and that allows you to set all that up. Um, you can see I already have a ton of bookmarks, so what I did is create a folder to put my links in. So um, that's also something you can do, uh, or you can set it up across the top. Uh, like Cheryl's done here. So you can see she has all of her important functions there as a bookmark. So even if you can't set this as your uh, home or your startup page, you can set bookmarks that will make it easier for you to do what you need to do. Another important function that you need to consider is uh, pop-ups. So most of us have pop-up blockers on our computer in order to be able to access some of the pages that actually operate as a pop-up, you have to allow pop-ups for not everything, but just this particular web page. You go under the advanced section for Chrome and go into content settings. And if you go down here, you are going to see, there it is, uh, pop-ups and redirects. And when you click on that, you can keep your pop-ups blocked for most sites. But it's very helpful if you add your page for the staff client. And so I added a very generic one so that I could access um, any pop-ups that come up in the, in the trainer. So that's a good thing to add. And again, these instructions are all in the knowledge book. So that particular one is here. And it has some screenshots for you. All right, I did want to spend a few minutes on the portal homepage here. You can see that uh, it does look very similar to uh, the one in the staff client, but you don't have the little hot buttons. Um, they have also consolidated some of the information uh, that was here in the center. They've cleaned it up a little bit and made it look nice. They did also consolidate some of the drop down menus. So you can see search. Uh, was very tidy. Search for patrons, search for copies, search the catalog, and you have all of these functions as well. And so it works very well, and there's not as much repetition as you would experience previously. So you can see um, you can also change the operator just like you could in the staff client. So all the keyboard shortcuts that you could use, uh, even though you don't have your hot buttons, all the keyboard shortcuts work. So for instance, if I do uh, Shift and F1, uh, so I see my uh, register patron page. And you can see if I start resizing this, it will change to suit the size 
of my window. So you can do this on, well, let's say a cell phone or an iPad theoretically, although um, there are some iPad issues getting it to uh, to work. But say you had a, a Surface and you could use potentially use it on uh, a Windows tablet. You can also uh, do, oops, yes, just making sure I didn't save anything. You can use your F2 for check-in, your F3 to search the catalog. So uh, another thing I did want to show you is uh, when you log into your workstation, you can make changes to your workstation. So if you go under administration, this is, this is one function that you definitely can access through the administration window. Uh, so if you log in there, you can set your default search library. And obviously these would be our NC Cardinal libraries. But I'll set mine at BR1. Or I could set it at my system. Let's say I want to set this at my system level. And my preferred library is BR1, which is where I logged in. And I'm just going to use the advanced search screen. You could pick numeric or mark expert if, if you wanted to. I can also disable sounds. So if I don't want uh, sounds to happen, I can do that or I can leave it unchecked. So you can make, make those changes. Then I also wanted to show you how to register a patron. So we'll go uh, under circulation and register patron. Again, uh, we could also do the shift plus F1 to do that. And registration screen is basically the same. Um, that really hasn't changed. It is highlighted to show you the, the required settings. That one is pretty straightforward. I am going to register a patron that is a, a save and clone because I want to uh, tie it together for a future process. So I'm going to leave this actually and search for a particular patron. One thing that I can show you here is the drop-down box that allows you to make your screen a little tidier so you don't have to have the entire search form if you only want to search a small number of fields. So if you only want to search first and last name, then uh, you don't have to have the whole thing drop down. But I did want to point out, too, that you can search by date of birth now. So date of birth, uh, year, month, and day. Uh, you can also, of course, isolate some uh, patron permission group or uh, locations. But we do usually recommend uh, if you're searching for a new patron, if you're going to be issuing a new barcode, then you do need to search the whole consortium as usual. Uh, we also recommend using include inactive and I'm going to search and there's my patron and you'll see when he click on his barcode to open him up and uh, one of the things you can see is that the patron information is vertical here on the left that again helps with the resizing aspect so if I'm resizing my screen uh, things do move a little bit I can also shrink that and make it disappear if my screen is smaller. What I plan to do is to register a child for this patron. So Save and Clone works the same as it always has. And it's going to bring up my registration screen. And it's going to include the address for that patron. And I have my little cheat sheet. There we go. And it's going to fill that in. One thing you'll notice is that the password fields have been reduced from two to one. And they should pre-fill as you all have configured them. So if you have it set up to be the last four digits of the phone number or the last four digits of the barcode number, whatever the, those settings are, those should uh, move over and, and translate. So I'm going to register my patron and um, the date of birth field. So you have a little calendar widget. Let's say other. So I would put in her, probably her, her dad's driver's license and, and uh, put in his name uh, as the 
parent. I don't see that might be blocked out. I'm going to have to check and see whether um, the parent guardian field is blocked out on this. So you can see you can list a secondary identification. And some of this is configurable, so it may be slightly different in my trainer than it is in our, in our version. All right. And I'm just going to add in some information here for her. Uh, in this, everybody is just a patron. And I can add um, some of these. Some of these uh, user settings for the contact information can be really useful for a uh, hold notification. So that's important to, to make sure you have that information. And I'm going to add that. All right. And then I am going to save her. So I've registered my patron kind of as usual. And then just click on her card number and you can see her account pops up. One thing to show you is that there is no box around the patron name. So it doesn't quite give you as much information as you're used to in the staff client. So there are no colored boxes. Uh, the tech does change color. So if a patron is not in good standing, uh, let's take a look at this patron. Well, actually, I guess I can just go to checkout, which is what I usually do when I have the patron barcode. So when I bring this patron up, you can see the text is red, and it gives me a message to tell me what what's going on with her account. There are kind of some warnings that that something's going on. It does give you um, you know information here, like she has a lost item. Uh, it's not quite as informative, but it does definitely alert you with that red text. So hopefully that will work. That will also happen, say, if a, a patron is expired. I also wanted to show you in the search screen uh, that we have something called Add to Bucket. There is documentation about this in the knowledge book about using buckets. I won't go uh, much into that today, but I just wanted you to see that there is an add to bucket button there. That's kind of handy. All right, let's look for Jane. And there she is. I did want to show you that uh, the email address in the patron account is clickable. So if I click on that, I'm going to get my email. I can send her a message directly, which is pretty cool. One thing that has changed in the look of the web client that was discussed in the webinar that Mobius did for us is the column picker. The column picker is still here. The icon looks a little different, so you have the little down arrow. And they have sorted it, and I do like this, that they've made the place where you go to save columns always in the same spot. Some people may, may also have found that annoying. You do always have sort of these control things up here, and then down the bottom are the fields that you can choose to show or not show. You can see that they have a little green check when you've selected them, and so you can select new ones or take things off. So if I don't want to see the circulation modifier, and the management uh, was also discussed about how you sort columns and so you sort columns here and you can choose the order that you want so you want the title to be first uh, so you can move that up oops there we go and i did i'm going to have to play with this more because i did do the sort priority and it still didn't quite function the way I expected. But it it is workable, and you can uh, manage your column widths, uh, not by dragging, as was discussed also by Mobius, but by uh, using the little expanders or the shrinkers. That is a little more cumbersome, but also allows you to have a little more control that way. And you do have to turn it off if you don't want it to show. And you can save columns that way. So that's helpful. You can see uh, you can also reset to the default. And there are a couple. 
to download full CSV um, that we've always sort of had down here at the bottom somewhere and the print full grid. So, you know, if you had a lot of information there, you could print the whole grid and I'll show you uh, how we use that a little later on. I did want to show you something interesting with bills and there's a nice feature here that shows kind of a, a more comprehensive billing statement for the patron. So it tells you kind of what they owed, what they're billed, what they've paid, refunds that are available if you do that, credits if you do that, things you've voided in this session. So it's a little easier to understand than kind of trying to scroll through. You can, in your column picker, if you need to sort through this, uh, you can add things like a note. So if I want to add that and manage my width a little bit, we can see what my note was. So uh, I build her $2 uh, for a replacement case. So you can see that shows up. We do have the dark color here on the lost item for which she paid a little bit of money. And one thing that you can see is uh, if, if, for instance, I was going to make a payment on something, I do need to check this box, but at least it's not a box that doesn't show. So <laughs> at least you know you have to click on it to, uh, to, to pay something. One thing that's different about the payment is that you can use the little up or down arrow. Thankfully, you can't go into negative numbers, but let's say she wants to pay another dollar on this. I can still and to, I can select um, all the all the payment types as before and uh, apply my payment. And it shows up. You can right click on the line item and get your actions menu. You can also click on the actions menu. You can see they, they've they shortened that, so it just says actions, which is nice. And so I can click on full details and I can see the detailed information about this billing uh, just as I could before. Uh, it does give you kind of a nicer look and feel, I think. Let's see. I did want to look at checking out so again I can go to my checkout screen or hit my F1 button and put in my patron barcode see if I can check out an item there it is checks out as normal um, you can see you have the title hyperlinked as well so got my checkout information the item is checked out. You can also click on the item barcode and go to that. And let's try to check this out to Jane. And I want to show you a box that comes up. Okay, the open circulation box comes up if this item is already checked out. And it does look a little different. Uh, you have just the normal check in and check out button. And so there is no forgiving fines, check in and check out. Uh, there aren't actually any fines on this one, but uh, I can always check this box in case and then do the normal check in and check out. Um, it just looks a little different, but acts very similar. When a patron checks out, they can have an emailed receipt. Uh, this was something that Mobius also discussed in the last webinar, but that's a really handy one. A lot of staff have asked for that. So you can just send an email receipt or print receipt or do both. Um, you can you have your done button here as uh, we have in the staff client, and that is actually going to shut down this window so it's going to ask to to print the receipt for me and just take me back to the checkout screen. So, um, so that's handy to have those receipt options available to us now. And oh, you have a question. Sure. Uh, 
can you set email receipts as a default method? Yes, that is in the patron account. If I bring up my patron again, um, so that's the retrieve last patron, um, then you can see in her account, uh, There is an email checkout receipts by default. And so as long as you check that, then that patron will get automatically get an emailed receipt and you don't have to select that. Staff can do this and patrons can do this as well in their own account. So if we go to the check-in screen, there we go. All right, I get the pop-up message for my hold slips and I can print that or not print that. And you can see the, you know, it has the usual default information there. But I had a little copy alert on that. So you can go and click on view as you normally would and take a look at the item status for the item. And uh, one of the cool features that you can do now is to add a temporary copy alert and it's a lot easier to navigate to. Um, there are types that you can select or you can just ignore that and add in your alert. You can make it temporary or uh, permanent. So if you are adding the number of disks, let's say, you might not want to make that temporary, but in this case, uh, since I just want a new shelf label, uh, that is going to be temporary. And I can say OK and check in my item again. Let's see if I get my pop-up. No, I don't get my copy alert pop-up. Hmm. Uh, question we, how long is the temporary message there? Well, it's cleared is my understanding. You can actually clear that yourself. All right, we'll add another alert. I'm not sure if I have to do this. Let's try this. Okay, definitely there. Okay, there's the clear button. So it comes up there. Oh, because I chose the checkout one. I see. Okay, I'm definitely going to have to uh, explore these a little further. I apologize. To see, um, you may have to apply one of those uh, or, or under the type. So, so I guess I would have had to make it a check in of damaged copy alert. This is more uh, in depth than I realized. So we have looked a little bit at the item status screen and I have a few open here. Uh, you can see that we do have the same information. You can see we have list view and then detail view. And that gives you the recent circ history and a circ history list where the staff client would give you the pop up list of as many previous patrons as you had chosen. This gives a default of one, but it can be set to the number of previous patrons that you want to see, just like it was in the staff client. Uh, it shows you holds and transits the cataloging information and the triggered event screen as well. So that functions uh, pretty much as the previous one and, and shows you the same information and the copy alerts are, are the main thing that, that look a little different. I know some circulation folks will make changes to items, for instance, if they need to uh, replace the barcode or change the, the copy status or the uh, copy location, then uh, they can do that. 
it's no longer called item attributes. It's just under edit items. And so if I click on that, it's going to bring up the attributes here so I can make my changes and save those just as usual. The cataloging committee wants to be sure that uh, folks know that, as, as I mentioned earlier, cataloging should be done in the staff client. And CERC staff, though, need, need to make some of these changes. So they should be able to make edits in the screen to shelving location, copy status, replace a barcode, uh, mark an item missing, or mark it damaged. And actually, those can happen here. Mark an item damaged or mark an item missing from the item status screen itself. So those are all things you can do. Uh, editing the call number, uh, if anyone needs to do that, that should be done in the staff client. I think Jennifer has been experimenting with this at Davidson and said that they were not able to make edits to the call number successfully in the client. So that is something you would still need to do in the staff client. Let's search the catalog. So I'm going to go to uh, search and search the catalog. You can also hit F3. And I'm going to search for one of my books here. And you can see a highlighting that also was discussed in the previous webinar. The terms that I entered as search terms are highlighted in each of the bib records. And that can be helpful sometimes, but you can disable the highlighting and it'll take that away. So if people find that more annoying than helpful, then that can also go away. So I'm gonna go into my catalog record. Everything uh, looks pretty much the same. I haven't seen a lot of differences between this and the staff client searches, you do have these tabs, which I think are kind of helpful, uh, where you can see the hold screen. So that means you don't have to go to the drop down menu as much. So that I think is uh, easier for a lot of the things that that you tend to want to look at. Uh, if I want to place a hold for one of my patrons, I can click place hold. And as uh, Moby's highlighted for us in the last webinar, you can search for your patron here. So I've got my patron and this is his pickup location. And I can hit submit. I can also place multiple holds. Um, Oh, I didn't authorize the uh, the option I thought I had, but um, where you can place uh, multiple holds for the same item. Um, you can also uh, do your meta record hold here. And uh, you can also suspend the hold and set an activation date. If you, your patron, you know, says I'm going on vacation and so I want to um, pick it up later, then you can say, um, you know, pick it up 10, 12, 2018. Oh, I lost my patron. <laughs> All right. So you can uh, see that it says it's suspended and it'll be reactivated on October 12th for the patron. And then you hold. Uh, one cool thing that I know a lot of people will appreciate about holds is that you can adjust your view of holds. So not only can you see the branch and the consortium level, you can see the holds by system. That's something that people have been have been begging for, so that uh, you can sort and and see how many holds your system actually has. So for instance, if it's a, an item with the six month age hold protection, then you have, you have that information on hand and it's much easier to sort through. Uh, one thing I did want to just mention that again, we did talk about in the previous Mobius webinar, but if you want to select items 
you can click on each line or you can hit shift or control and highlight multiple lines. As long as you don't click on any of the hyperlinks, it will highlight uh, several things in the list. So I can click on each one individually. I can click the checkbox that will check all the items in the list, or you know, I can hold down my control button and just highlight a couple. So that's a great way to be able to sort of navigate through your list if you only want to apply changes to one item or several. You can see my suspended status here for that item. For holds, items can be checked out by a different patron than the patron who requested the item. Holds and transits. It's captured for this patron. I'm going to see if I can check it out for Jane. So if I'm on my checkout screen and I list a barcode, it's going to tell me that the item is on the hold shelf for another patron. So, and it will give me the patron's name and a link to her account. So I can check it out to Jane. Let's say, you know, Norma is her grandmother. And I know that, or there's a note in the account. I know we have a lot of libraries who regularly do this for their patrons who are maybe spouses or parents and children. So it's it's a bit of a pain to have to go in and cancel the hold for Norma to check it out to Jane. So you can check the box to cancel this hold upon checkout and force the action. So it will check out to Jane. The downside to that is that the statistical data for hold fulfillment will not count this as a fulfilled hold because it did check out to a different person. Let me take a look at the pull list, since I may have something on the pull list. Yay, one thing. <laughs> great. All right, so this is not going to be great for demonstration purposes, but you can manage the columns here and sort the columns as we highlighted before. So I've sorted um, my columns here by shelving location, call number, so that I see those first. And I have my, my author and my title here, so I can move the title up. Uh, I can add the call number. Uh, if I have a prefix, I can add that to the list. So you can you can sort the way that they appear on the screen I'm recording some supplemental information after I've had an opportunity to dig deeper into the pull list, and I wanted to share with you all what I have found so far. So in looking at the pull list, one thing that was brought to my attention is that you can drag these columns and move them around. So that is something that um, you all may find useful rather than using the manage columns. Manage columns is useful when you're picking additional things to add and want to move them around all at one time. So it's more comprehensive in that it allows you to do a lot of things at one time. I have not so far found that the sort priority works in a way that I would expect. One of the comments that we got during the original webinar was that it allowed you to sort, prioritize which columns sorted first. But in my work with it to try to sort things, so I've, I've uh, chosen the pickup library and also potential copies as a, something to sort on and I'll save my columns and you can see this doesn't change so uh, my pickup libraries don't sort in alpha order and even if I go to circulation and pull this list again I find that it still keeps it in the same order And when I go back in, my sort priority is gone. 
So still not clear on how sort priority contributes to the process. So I'm going to keep looking into that, but I just did want to let you all know that I have looked at it and so far I'm not finding that it works in a way that I would expect. So back to the pull list. One of the helpful things with your holds pull list is to be able to sort the shelving locations to the order where they're physically located in your library so that you can be more efficient as you pull your items. So the way you do that is to go to local administration. I'm going to right click here and open it in a new tab. And I want to go to copy location order. So when I load that screen, you can see that I've already played with the order of my shelving locations uh, for part of this demonstration. So I've, I've dragged a juvenile video up here and adult nonfiction up here. The way that you change this is to just drag columns up and drop them. So it is a little bit time consuming to do. It is workstation specific. So a good idea and a recommendation we've always made uh, with a staff client is to do it on the one workstation where you're generally going to print the pull list. And so you don't have to do it on every single workstation. So I've changed my order based on the items that are actually on my hold shelf. So you can see that they are not sorted in that order on the screen. When I click the print full list, one of the disadvantages of that print full list that has not yet been resolved, but has been discussed in launchpad tickets, is that it does not pay attention to the order that you have on the screen, the column order that you have on the screen. It defaults to its own uh, setup that is not necessarily as beneficial to uh, to users. So your your shelving location is way over here. It does sort based on the shelf location order that I set up over here. So juvenile video first, adult nonfiction second. So when I go back here, you can see juvenile video is here, adult nonfiction is here, and adult fiction is next. So it does pay attention to that sort order, but if you've selected things that aren't showing here uh, as, as I have on my screen, then that may not be helpful for your printout. So that's a disadvantage of this print method. The other print method is the print full grid. So you can see when I bring up that full grid, it does pay attention to what's on my screen. Unfortunately, it doesn't pay attention to my copy location order. So juvenile video is not listed first. It's all the way at the bottom. The shelving location is just in alpha order. That's not as efficient as I would like. And the other option, you can go to print full grid and get an Excel spreadsheet like this one. And you can organize it based on the shelving location order that you want. But, you know, if you have a hundred things on your pull list and have to move around the shelf order, it's time consuming. So this is one of the areas where we're finding that the web client is perhaps not quite solved in terms of applying the same expectations or satisfying the same expectations that we have from how we use the staff client. In this case, when you only use your pull list once or twice a day in most, in most libraries, you may want to actually continue to use the staff client for your pull list for the time being. We will be monitoring the launch pad bugs and the status of those and let you all know if this issue is resolved. This is just one of those transition issues that some libraries may find this functional enough and some libraries may prefer to use the staff client. So we wanted to present 
those options to you. I had some difficulty during the webinar getting my trainer to access the hold shelf. So I recorded this after the fact because I wanted to show you how you can access the hold shelf through the web client. So you can go to circulation, hold shelf, and that will pull up the hold shelf like I have it here. I've already arranged my columns the way I want them by using manage columns to select the things that I want to show and take off the things that I don't want to show. And then I can also arrange things by dragging and dropping the columns to the order that I want them. And so that is helpful. But you see that it doesn't sort by last name. So if I click on any of these column headers, they're not hyperlinked, so they don't sort in the way that the pull list will sort when you click on them. So um, my only option here is to either print the full list, which will only print it in the order that it's listed, and that's not terribly helpful. Also, you can see some of the things are crowded together. My other option is to print the full grid, but you can see that also does not order things for me. It does give me a slightly nicer look, but the only way that I can order things by the patron last name in order to take a list to the shelf is to download the full CSV. And when I do that, I'm going to get a list like this. And you can see it is in exactly the same order as my list here. So last name, first name, title, author, available date, shelf expire time, etc., etc. So all I have to do is order my column from A to Z. And if I want to fix my barcodes, I can do that for my books and print this out and I'm good to go. So it's not quite as easy as the staff client. So if you prefer to print out your hold shelf from the staff client, again, that is an option, but this is fairly workable, I think, in the web client. Well, that's all I had to cover. I think I hit all all of my bullet points. If you all don't have any questions, then I guess we can wrap it up a little early today. We will be planning more webinars for you, so you can look forward to hearing about those. Benjamin may have more to say about any of that, but um, we'll, we'll be letting you know as, as more come about. Yeah, in general, we're just, uh, we have a couple of different topics and, and some things will be more targeted at the administrators for your libraries and getting things set up with uh, receipt printing and some of that sort of thing. So um, we'll continue to announce uh, webinars as we get closer. Right now, it looks like we're about a month away from the upgrades. So we're continuing to uh, uh, work through the questions that you have and, and uh, try to get together uh, training and content to help uh, prepare everybody for this. All right. Well, Thank you very much for coming, and uh, let me know if you all have any questions later. We're happy to happy to cover anything that comes up. Thank you very much, everyone.